Welcome to palm oil country. Indonesia is the world's biggest supplier of raw palm oil. Global consumption is at 60 million tons per year and rising. The cheap mass-produced fat is in a wide variety of food products. Palm oil dominates supermarket shelves. It's in soap, shampoo, detergent and cosmetics. Buses and cars in London, in Paris and in Berlin run on fuels that contain palm oil. Since the EU decided to save the climate by imposing biofuel quotas, Member states are committed to adding at least 5% vegetable oil to fuels. The quota is expected to rise to 10%. But it's not just European legislators that have fallen prey to the biofuel fever. The Indonesian government subsidizes every litre of biofuel with 4,000 rupiah, that's about 40 euro cents. And there are plans to keep raising the amount of palm oil added to biofuels to 30%. There are also high-flying plans to drastically increase the use of palm oil in aviation fuel. But what are the effects on Indonesians and their environment? Kalimantan, the Indonesian part of Borneo, in November 2015. For three months, locals lived under a blanket of toxic sulfurous smog. <laughs> Air pollution levels were 3,000% above the health-threatening legal limit. Hospitals struggled to cope. Many infants suffered permanent brain damage due to a lack of oxygen. More than 9,000 people died from the effects of smoke poisoning. Locals tried to put out the flames with nothing but sticks, an impossible task. A long drought caused fires in the peat bogs to spread quickly. Over 3,000 forest fires raged throughout the country, not just on Indonesian Borneo, but also on Sumatra, Sulawesi, and for the first time, Papua. Deforestation through slashing and burning has reached an unprecedented scale. We're in Merauke, a region of southern Papua. The government has permitted the destruction of one million hectares of rainforest to make way for palm oil plantations. But many locals oppose the plan. They don't want their forests turned into plantations. I belong to the Mahutsa tribe. This is our land. You're not from here, are you? I'm the project leader. This is my secretary. We have come here to tell you to stop destroying our forest immediately and to leave our land. I don't mean you personally, but as the person in charge, I ask you to withdraw your machinery immediately. Yes, sir, we can do that. We'll withdraw our bulldozers immediately. I didn't know this was your land. Stop the oppression and land theft, the sign reads. Locals have set it up in protest against the illegal loggers. In many other regions, too, rainforest is being burnt down. 2.6 million hectares have been destroyed, a region almost the size of Belgium. Palm oil companies are responsible for about half the fires laid.
In the province of Jambi on Sumatra, police were able to prove arson by confiscating a petrol canister as evidence. The palm oil company PTRKK was fined 12 million euros for arson. The Unilever supplier was found guilty of burning down the forest, the cheapest way to make lucrative palm oil plantations. Back in Kalimantan, Indonesian Borneo, police here have not yet managed to find a single arsonist. Who did this? They can't find the arsonists or don't want to find them. But everything here was burnt down, even our fields and houses. Why not sell your land? It's the most precious thing I own. If we work with the palm oil company, we have to take on debt. I have four sons. I want them to have the land, and I'll defend it. But the pressure is mounting. The demand for palm oil is on the rise all over the world. In 2016, palm oil consumption reached 62 million tons. Since Europe introduced its biofuel policy, the land used for palm oil monocultures has quadrupled. An area three times the size of Switzerland has been turned into monocultures. By funding these investments, international banks are enabling this destruction, among them Citibank, HSBC, Rado Bank, and Credit Suisse, to name but a few. Twenty-five Indonesian palm oil companies have together received no less than 15 billion euros. Not a day goes by without news of protests against palm oil companies in various regions of Indonesia. Police are routinely ordered to crack down on demonstrators. Hundreds of farmers in northern Sumatra are demanding to be given back their land. At another demonstration, tensions escalate when protesters torch the building of a palm oil company. These farmers are occupying a plantation, demanding compensation for land they say was stolen. Hundreds of farmers are demonstrating outside a palm oil company. They accuse the company of illegally logging their village forest and poisoning their water supplies. The company has been pumping the toxic wastewater from its plant into the river. These residents are demanding the return of their land and that local men be released from prison. The palm oil company has accused the men of illegally harvesting palm nuts from its plantations. Vadian from Borneo was convicted of theft and sentenced to six months in prison. The company accused me of stealing from their plantation, but I was only harvesting the palm oil fruits on my land. I have the right to do so. I own that land. I informed the company several times that I own the land. I also wrote letters to the company and to the government. I never got a reply from anyone. This kind of treatment is just inhumane. In March 2018, Salonok Ladang Mass, a supplier of Wilmar PT, tried to further expand their plantations. Vadian was there at the time. What are you doing here? What is this? You can't just come here and tear down these trees. What you're doing is against the law. 
I think somebody sold this land and we're doing what we always do. Nobody has sold this land. There's an agreement in place here. Nobody is allowed to cut down these trees. Otherwise, we'll have another conflict. I think you're from PT Salonok Mass, and you're destroying the last bit of forest we have left here. This is unbelievable. It's outrageous. They're so bold about it. How dare they do this? To cut down our forest and destroy our planet. We identify with our land. We're deeply connected to it. They're just killing our identity. They just put their plantations and factories on our land. Officially, the company owns 50% and we own 50% of the land. But in reality, we have just 10%. Although half the land is ours, it's documented in the land register. <laughs> Only a few kilometers further on, there's another dispute with a Wilmar supplier. For this whole area, PT Sal already paid compensation in 2009 to Mr. Peter. <laughs> Mr. Peter doesn't own any land here. But I have the paper. No. Clear off here. No violence. No violence. What's in this paper? Do you have a license to operate here? Where are your documents? We've not received any compensation. Where's your proof? This land doesn't belong to P.T. Sal. We have a title deed for this land. Where's your deed? Why don't you show us one if you have one? Not all farmers stand up to the pressure. Siahudin gave in. Today he lives from 50 hectares of palm oil plantation. The pressure from the palm oil companies was just too big. They started cutting down my trees. They stole from me. I stood up against them and they stopped, but the pressure continued. They wanted to expand their palm oil plantations at any price. I was criminalized. They just wanted to control our land. Half of Indonesia's palm oil plantations are run by just 25 companies. Among them are Indonesian giants such as Sinar Mass, Salim Group, Raja Gada Mass, Muzim Mass, and international corporations such as Simdabi and Wilmar. The world's largest palm oil dealer supplies Europe's leading biofuel producer Nesti Oil and the food giant Unilever. Fourteen of the 30 richest men in Indonesia make their billion euro fortunes in palm oil. Among them, the owners of the Makin Group, Salim, Sinar Mar Golden Agri, Raja Garuda Mass and Wilmar. They also dominate the real estate business, tobacco, food processing and Indonesia's mass media. On Indonesia's National Press Day, the close ties between the palm oil industry and the media are in evidence. 
Even President Yoko Widodo takes center stage in the celebrations. In the following ceremony, the Indonesian Palm Oil Association, GAPKI, and the Indonesian Journalists' Union will sign an agreement to report fairly. Everyone seems to agree palm oil is good for the country. We want to see for ourselves and meet Sidik, an independent palm oil farmer from Jambi. I only own one hectare of land on which I harvest about 400 to 500 kilograms of palm oil. I need about seven euros a day to feed my family and for my children to go to school. If the quality of the fruit is poor, I barely make six euros, which isn't enough. I'm constantly in debt. I don't own anything anymore. Even a kiosk owner has loaned me money. I own everybody money and I can't afford cigarettes. We can only buy what we absolutely need to live. If I include the cost of maintaining the plantation, then I'm not making any profit at all. I'm just falling deeper and deeper into a debt trap. I harvest every 15 days, so twice a month. Then I buy 20 kilos of rice, but that's not enough for 15 days. I'm telling you what my life is like every day. I have two children. They're in first and second grade of primary school. They've both had to repeat a year because they didn't attend school often enough. All their friends have money for snacks and things. And mine were always embarrassed because we have no money. That's our life. Farmers who don't own any land are forced to work on plantations as day laborers. None of them have work contracts or insurance. I leave at 2 o'clock in the morning and get home at 3 in the afternoon. Nobody cares about transport for us. Often we have to walk all the way home. Each day, she is to harvest the fruits of three hectares of land, disperse 12 sacks of fertilizer and remove weeds on one hectare of land. If she falls short of that, her pay is cut. Sometimes I earn 7 euros a day, sometimes only 1 euro 50. The plantations have completely changed rural life. Most people are now dependent on palm oil. Indonesia supplies the whole world with palm oil, the problems of deforestation and land conflicts and human rights violations have long been reported in Europe. The European Commission is now asking for more sustainable palm oil production and the implementation of environmental standards. To meet the requirements, companies like Unilever, Nestle Oil and Wilmar, together with the WWF, founded the Round Table for Sustainable Palm Oil, or RSPO. The palm oil factory PT Agrindo Inda Pesada belongs to Wilmar. 
The RSPO certificate is supposed to guarantee transparency throughout the supply chain, from Wilmot's factory to the plantation. Mulianto is a small farmer who supplies palm fruits to several palm oil mills. His largest buyer is PT Agrindo Inda Posada. When we deliver to PT Agrindo Inda, they readily take our fruits. The same applies to PT Sal. There are no agreements. Are there conditions for sale? No. As long as the fruits are not unripe or rotten, they accept them. But basically, they'll buy anything at a discount. The fruits are sold right after harvest. They must be processed within 24 hours. Not just Mulianto's fruits are bought up, but all the fruits from all other farmers in the region. A distributor buys everything and pays the farmers directly. The palm oil fruits are mixed up and delivered to the factory. P.T. Agrindo Inda Posada won't allow us to film, so we have to hide our camera as we try to verify what Mulianto has told us. The result of our investigation? All the fruits are accepted and mixed up. Nobody cares where they came from and how they're grown. There's no way of tracing the origin of these palm oil kernels. All that matters is that the mill runs 24-7, but the European Union and large buyers such as Nesti Oil and Unilever claim that 60% of palm oil comes from traceable, sustainable production. According to them, work safety standards must be met and the toxic pesticide Paracat is banned. Does Mulianto know about the RSPO regulations? He uses the highly toxic pesticide Paracat, which is banned according to the RSPO. He doesn't even wear a mask. He can't afford to buy protective clothing and is putting his health at risk. Is your palm oil plantation RSPO certified? No, no, it belongs to me. Do you know the RSPO? I don't understand. Do you know about the production standards RSPO members must comply with? I don't know about any of this, I just want to sell. Has anybody ever come by and informed you about the RSPO regulations? No, never. What do you consider to be sustainable and ethical palm oil production? Ethical? I don't understand. Have you ever been invited by the RSPO to take part in training? Never. Has anyone from the company ever come to inspect your plantation? No, nobody has ever come. What are you doing to maintain water levels and protect your water sources? There's nothing I can do. I have less and less water because the oil palms consume so much of it. Do you know the forest protection zone by the river? No, what's that? Has anybody ever examined you to see what effects the pesticides may be having on your health? No. Do you burn your land to make way for plantations? Yes. That's the reality of the RSPO certificate and its guidelines. Under RSPO standards, child labor is forbidden. How old are you? I'm eight years old and I'm in second grade. What are you doing on the plantation? I work here. I pick up the palm oil fruits that are left on the ground and put them in a large sack. I collect them all in a big pile. 
Berapa banyak, berapa goni yang ada? How many sacks a day? Lima goni. About five or so. Kira-kira beratnya berapa? How heavy are they? Tahu nggak? I don't know. Heavy enough that my father has to help me. President Widodo's government says it's concerned about the situation of small farmers and the fact that the yield of their plantations is declining, especially those that are 20 or 25 years old. These small farmers are expected to be able to compete with large corporations. When the palm trees are fully grown, farmers can harvest eight tons of oil per hectare per year. How many tons are farmers producing whose plantations are 20 to 25 years old? Just about two tons per year, right? So that's a quarter. So if companies can produce eight tons per hectare on their large-scale plantations, then small farmers must be able to do the same on their smaller plantations. To plant one hectare of new palm trees would cost as much as a family with two school-aged children needs to live for a whole year. If the companies can produce eight tons, then the small farmers must be able to do the same, not just two tons. We need five sacks of fertilizer for the plants at a cost of 17 euros on average. If we take out loans to buy fertilizer, then we have to pay back at least an additional three euros in interest. We're already in debt. I can't afford to buy any more fertilizer. I have only just saved three euros to pay back the interest for fertilizer I already used on my plants. I simply can't afford to renew my plantation. If companies can produce eight tons and the farmers only produce two, that's because they don't maintain their plantations enough. We have no machinery, we have no money, we hardly have enough to survive. How should we maintain our plantations? Once the oil production is stable, farmers can turn their attention to cultivating natural rubber, coffee, cocoa and nutmeg. The biggest problem are farmers who don't manage to renew their plantations regularly with young palm trees. Not all Indonesian farmers buy into the promise that palm oil monocultures will lead to greater prosperity. Millions have chosen to continue with traditional farming. The villagers of Pasa Terunsan in Jambi are cultivating their land as they have done for hundreds of years. These are our three pillars of farming. First, rice. That's the basis for our existence. Then we have livestock, which is what brings us prosperity. The good thing is that we can feed ourselves with our own rice for half of the year. We always have enough. We never have to buy any. When we need money to send our children to college, then we can sell a cow or a buffalo. The third pillar is natural rubber. That we sell to get cash. So while the women harvest rice, the men can collect rubber. Palm oil companies have tried repeatedly to lay claim to this land too, but without success. The communal law forbids the conversion of forest into harmful monocultures. Anyone who breaks these laws is banished from the village. The Dayak people live on Kalimantan. Here too, there are no palm oil plantations. In the village of Kubung, locals believe that the forest is home to the gods. They consider the forest to be holy. 
and they won't allow anyone to destroy it. But that doesn't stop the representatives of palm oil companies from coming here regularly, making big promises to locals trying to tempt them. Warga ini dia pikirannya kan dia sudah cukup dengan hutan itu sudah we are convinced that the forest belongs to all of us and will give all of us what we need to live. It's not worth sacrificing our forest in the hope of making quick money. The forest has been our source of life for centuries. That's why we won't allow it to be cut down to produce palm oil or anything else. When companies come here and try to lure us with easy money, we're not interested. It's these indigenous people and farmers, respectful of their traditions, who are protecting the land. The older the palm oil plantations get, the less they yield. With rice, it's exactly the opposite. They become more and more fertile over the years. We get more of what we need every year, so we're against palm oil. I have only my one small plantation. There's no more land. I don't know what to do. The world's palm oil consumption is projected to grow almost 70% by 2020. Another 17 million hectares will be turned into monocultures, unless the demand is curbed.